Hi, everybody. Uh, we are so honored and it's such a pleasure to have Dan Brokshar here with us for this series. You may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? Dan, please tell us about how you've been living history. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sri and Orit and my two previous uh, speakers who set a very high bar. Um, my name is Dan. I'm at UC Berkeley and have a couple of other affiliations that are listed here. And I wanted to sort of give you a sense of of how I started life as a physicist. I think I'm a generation or maybe two older than, uh, than the previous speakers. Um, and talk about how sometimes a linear narrative is misleading. This I think ties in with what we heard from, uh, especially from JC. Um, and then, you know, how do you approach your career? And I'll give you my particular trajectory or at least a filtered view of that. And uh, maybe that will be interesting. So I started off, I was, uh, my, my parents are both uh, immigrants. I went to a high school that uh, didn't have a super, uh, um, it didn't have the same kind of support that uh, JC talked about at, at some of the, uh, the high-end high schools, but I still you know, was really excited about physics. I remember learning about the kinetic theory of gases and I thought, that's the coolest thing. You can write a few uh, simple equations, think things through and figure out something about the world. Um, and I feel like I've been fairly privileged to be at some of the places that have already been mentioned. I was an undergrad at Princeton. I spent a summer at Bell Labs when it was Bell Labs. Um, I was a grad student at Cornell with David Merman and Jim Sethna. Um, I spent a summer at the uh, ITP in Santa Barbara before the new building was built. This was when it was just the top floor, I believe, of this building. I was a postdoc at IBM, and then I've been at Berkeley now for over 30 years, um, all the time through this narrative, um, doing, doing different forms of physics. And the thing that really excited me, as I, I know excites many of, many of us, is I was never very interested in particle physics. I loved condensed matter physics as the example of the uh, kinetic theory showed. I love the idea that you can take individual pieces that maybe don't have any, that, are, that can think of as sort of almost featureless in some cases, bring them together and under the right circumstances, you get the as Phil Anderson said, more is different. Simple parts can combine to make uh, complicated holes that have interesting properties that you might not have guessed. And I just love this, this concept and that's kind of been the guiding principle um, of my career if, if, you can, if it can be said to have one. When I got to Berkeley, one of my senior colleagues gave me this advice. He said, find something you can do well, and become the best in the world at it. The implication being that you should pick one thing and then drill in and spend your whole career refining your understanding of that one thing. And, and that was never, that was never going to work for me. Um, even in Kinesh Matter Physics, I worked on lots of different problems, um, some sort of statistical physics related, some quantum physics related, some uh, in, the, in the interstices between those two. Um, and these are some of the systems, I won't go through them, but quasi-crystals from my PhD thesis, um, high temperature superconductivity, and several other things that um, if you recognize them, you'll, you'll see that I, I was kind of all over the place, but always focusing on this problem of what's the sort of simple, often low energy perspective that you can extract from these complicated systems, some underlying simplicity based on their new symmetry or their new order. And everything was going well. I had a lab, I had funding, I had students, I had postdocs, I had some successful um, projects and I was up for tenure. And then that semester, things kind of went awry. Um, this molecule here is the thyroid hormone, which I had never heard of at that point. Um, and by the end of the semester, I had lots of this, lots more of this hormone than I should. Um, and it was making me feel miserable. Um, and I lost a lot of weight and I wasn't sleeping and I was irritable, all, all kinds of things that go along with hyperthyroidism. And at the end of that semester, I tried to figure out what was going on. And I found a, a doctor who said, oh, we can take care of this. We'll just irradiate your thyroid and you'll be fine. And I said, well, what's going on here? What's, the, what's, what's happening to me? Explain it to me before you irradiate me. And um, the first doctor couldn't answer the question, nor could the second, but the third one had an answer to this, to this question. How does this little molecule make me feel so terrible? And he said, well, your cells have too many mitochondria. And I said, I should feel great, right? 
power plant of the cell, I should have more power, right? And he said, no, those are just, you have a lot of them, but they're not really doing useful things. They're just burning. That's why you feel kind of jittery and, and your temperature is high and so forth. And I said, that's really interesting. How, how, does that, how does that work? How does this molecule make my body feel this way in all these different um, modalities? And he said, nobody really knows the answer. Um, there was a paper, and then he pointed me to a paper that he'd read a few months ago. And I thought, that's really cool. I, a person can wander in off the street, literally, you know, feverish, <laughs> and ask a question and have somebody say, nobody really knows the answer. And, um, you know, as I think all of us have had this, those who've taught have this experience that that's a very rare thing, right? One of the cool things about teaching physics is you get up in front of the class, you start lecturing. And for the most part, you know, almost like a ninja, students ask you questions and you can figure out in many cases the answer, right? Um, and to get a research question, you have to be kind of really deep into some some problem. And we're working with this, you know, unusual material or at very low temperatures or at very high pressures, um, something that that will get to the, the frontier of knowledge. But here, I could just sort of scratch the surface, or at least that's how it felt. And so that led me to a six year period where I was really kind of doing a different kind of uh, wandering. Eventually, right away, I was cured. The, the radiation actually works. And I take a supplement now to make up for the you know, to provide the right level of thyroid hormone. Uh, but I ended up having lots of questions, mostly originally biomedical. Um, my mom had some problems at this time. I had a friend who had cancer. And so I realized that this is kind of what I wanted to do. Um, at a fairly, you know, in my, I guess at this point I was 33. Um, and even though I, I hadn't done well in biology as an undergrad, you know, I knew, I knew some things, but not very much. Um, and critically, all my PhD students graduated when I was recovering. I hadn't taken on new students or postdocs because I was sick. And then I got tenure. And so by the time that I was kind of back on track, um, I, had a, I had a flexibility that, um, that I might not have had at any other point in my, in my career. Um, there were also new discoveries in physics that were right in my wheelhouse. Bose-Einstein condensation. I literally could do that on the side and be productive. Um, and importantly, I, I wasn't married, I didn't have any kids, I didn't have any real other responsibilities. And so I could just, you know, uh, cater to this new interest. And I spent several years taking classes, I took most of the graduate courses in, in biology at Berkeley, or took, I sat in on them, I got to know a lot of people, I did a lot of reading, I looked for projects and collaborations. And during this period, I had some great graduate students and a postdoc who kind of went with me on this, this journey. These guys were all, um, they, they, these, this group is all guys, but there were other women before and after, um, who kind of went with me on this journey and then some supportive colleagues. Bill Bialik had left Princeton, left Berkeley by this time, but um, uh, David Chandler, Arup, who's a chemical engineer, others had been very welcoming. And during this period, I worked on, you know, modeling dynamical systems in the developing retina, protein dynamics and simplified models with uh, yeah, the Steve Plotkin, who's no longer on the call, was uh, involved in similar kinds of things. And then towards the end, working on trying to understand um, spotted microarrays as another. I mean, these are kind of all over the place in biology, but they all had the same feature that they were about emerging order um, from, some, from some system. So there was, there was some kind of continuity there. Um, people would say, are you still doing physics? And I would say, yeah, kind of. And I would give the same spiel. But, um, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it. I mean, I was inevitable. I was inherently a physicist. There was no way around it. But I really was trying to become a biologist. I didn't, I didn't want to be, I sort of actively didn't want to be a physicist nibbling at biology. I wanted to be immersed in biology and using my physics and all the other things that I, that I knew. But I had this little answer. That I, that I gave. And eventually, through we don't have time, time to talk about how this came about, but I had the opportunity to join the Human Genome Project. The Department of Energy has a genomics facility that was uh, near Berkeley, and they needed a quantitatively minded scientist to lead what was a fairly large uh, um, quantitative uh, group. 
that was doing both technology development, but also um, science working with the data that was coming out of the genome project. And so I was at the right place at the right time at the right stage of my uh, career. And I, and I did that for a couple of years. Um, and that sort of catapulted me, I guess, into this stage that I've been in for the last 20 years, which is using genomics to try to understand aspects of biology, especially evolutionary biology. And so I think we all have this, this um, experience, right? There are things that you know how to do, things that you've thought deeply about and, and can, can try to make new advances in. And those then become your, the, the lens, the place you look for new problems. And for me, genomics was that area. Um, and the thing that really fascinated me was the idea that through genomics, I could address the relationships and similarities and differences and underlying genetics of a wide range of different animals. So this is a sea squirt, which is the invertebrate that's closest, most closely related to humans. Um, this is a comb jelly. Nobody really knows exactly what kind of animal it is. Uh, sea anemone, trichoplax, sponges, other animals that uh, have varying degrees of uh, worminess. And I just love the idea that I could, I could think about the relationships of all these animals using genomics and quantitative analysis, which was my physics background, um, to, to, to address that. And so this is, I think, almost my last slide. The, the, the big picture, the thing that's kind of motivate, motivated me for the last 20 years has been thinking about the tree of life. I'm showing here animals, but we also do some work on plants. Um, and using the general principle that if we look at diversity, so vertebrates are here and octopus is here and um, fruit fly is here. So if I compare fruit flies and vertebrates, if I see something that's similar between them, that's telling me something about their ancestor. And that ancestor lived a very long time ago. And so by looking at comparing living animals that are alive today all across the top of this tree, I can start to look back in time to really staggering uh, depths, you know, uh, out to, you know, close to a billion years of, of evolution and try to start to understand key events and key phenomena that happened all along this tree leading up to either us or any of these other branches. So what's the sort of summary? Well, I haven't really led you through the full random walk. That would take a lot longer than 10 minutes or probably I've gone over that <laughs> anyway. But um, in 2002, after working on the human genome and getting involved in, in leading some of these other animal diversity uh, sequencing projects to look at deep evolution, I ended up switching, bio, switching departments. So even though I have a 0% appointment in physics, I now teach in molecular and cell biology and have done that for 20 uh, years. I haven't taught physics in a long time. Although during the pandemic, you can see behind you, um, I reverted to reading physics in the early days as kind of my comfort food. I read a lot of general relativity books for some reason. Um, I'm still working on uh, genomics from the Department of Energy, on bioenergy crops, different uh, grasses, and trying to understand their evolution. I got involved also with a new graduate university in Okinawa, where I could do marine biology. And kind of surprisingly to me, and I think it would have been surprising to anybody who knew me uh, as a high school student or a college student, I've been a biologist longer than I was a physicist, which I think is okay. So that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, um, for this super inspiring finale to today's Living Histories Talks. Um, everybody, if you have questions, please feel free to unmute and ask away. I, I would also like to say that it's been really fun for me. I mean, at the time when I was kind of switching or you know trying to explore biophysics it was for in, in like the early to mid 90s it was something that not a lot of people were doing um and i felt kind of uh i mean i didn't really feel alone because i was sort of driven internally to do it but it was not the kind of community that you guys have built here so i, I i'm i'm really happy to see that that evolution that's that's come out and that there's such a such a wonderful group with diverse interests and backgrounds. Oh, well, thank you, Dan, for these very kind words. Um, 
let me go ahead and ask you a question about well, did you consider transitioning into an experimentalist and doing your own pipetting? And was that a scary step? So I understand this journey from physics to biology. Yeah. What about clean experiments to, oh my God, complex experiments? I guess I didn't, I didn't say it explicitly, but I, 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 I was, and I guess I still am a theoretical physicist. Um, I had that very strong impulse when I started working in, in or moving towards biology. And I did a, a sabbatical with uh, Eve Martyr's lab in, uh, at Brandeis, looking at uh, the, the, the neurobiology of the rhythmic pattern generation in the, in the crab. And I thought, well, I'll just retrain to do that, right? I'm retraining anyway. Why don't I just learn how to do that? And, and um, Eve, I remember Eve asked me, how old are you? I said, I'm 35. She said, well, you're never going to get very good at this. And I said, okay, well, that's just the challenge. Um, and she was right. You know, I, <laughs> it took me so long to do these uh, dissections that by the time the end of the day came, I basically destroyed a crab, but was not any, not very much close to doing, uh, doing any kind of serious data collection that would be useful. Um, and I think it would, and I, but I also didn't just want to be, you know, analyzing other people's data um, in a in a kind of an opportunistic way because um, I didn't I just didn't think that would be sort of as satisfying. So I I have worked. Uh, we have had various animals in the lab. We have done. Um, you know, molecular biology to the extent that that's um, experimental. Um, we've raised animals in the lab. We've done some behavioral work on squid. So th there's a there are a range of things. It's it's a little bit hard to do because um, for two reasons. One is to really keep animals. You need resources, um, and so somebody would have to give me. I'd have to apply for and get resources to work on a particular kind of creature. Um, and that would also at the same time mean that I would have to focus on one, <laughs> on one animal. And so, uh, it's been much more productive for me to find collaborators. I've had wonderful collaborators around the world, um, that I, I wish I could, could thank, but it would take a long time, um, working on all different kinds of animals from the lens of genomics, but then through discussions with them, if there's an experiment we need want to do, if there's an in situ hybridization or some, other kind of uh, experiment, then we can do that collaboratively. Uh, and that's worked out really well for a lot of different uh, organisms. So I, there was part of me that would love to have, you know, a, a full on research, you know, a wet lab. Um, but I know that it's not something that I could really kind of pull off. It would, it would diminish the other things that I, I'm excited about. Uh, thank you again, Dan, for this talk that, uh, that inspired us to rethink how we view points of inflection in our trajectories. Um, once again, on behalf of the audience, thank you, thank you. Thank um, you.